Hello and welcome to the second of our virtual events and the fifth large scale event that we've held for, uh, for innovators working with the NHS. I'm Lisa Hollins, I'm the Director of Innovation at NHS X and I have the privilege of leading a team that links with SMEs and innovators. So this event will be recorded, we're not recording any of your details but we will be recording the event for availability. Um, for, for others. Um, so I've had a long career in the NHS and worked with many inspirational people who are leading innovations in medicine and research. And when I manage services in hospitals, primary care and mental health um, organisations, I witness extraordinary kindness uh, and care every day. Um, but we can't do this on our own. Health services are changing and we need organisations to work alongside us. Um, we need to way, create new ways to commun communicate. We need to invest in new digital pathways and support patients to keep well in their homes. So we've been thankful for the generosity and inventiveness of our SMEs. And we wish to work together to co-create in inventions and innovations of the future. So I'd like to take people back to our first event where we asked what would make the, the largest difference for digital innovators and there were five main themes and these were for, from over 200 responses and those were and you you will probably remember adoption of technical standards procurement communication uh, demand signaling um, uh, supporting organizations to work with innovators and creating a digital ready workforce so we're going to cover three of those areas within um, the discussions today so we'll be covering technology standards engagement and scaling innovations in the main session um, this morning so we'll go then go on to give a broader view of technology across the nhs and the highlights for the future so we heard from innovators following the last session that they had missed the one-to-one -one exchanges that we used to have um, usually during the face-to-face -face sessions that we, we, we operated before COVID. And we've created three groups um, to have a more in-depth uh, question and answer session and to, uh, to ask some of the more detailed questions and those will follow this session. And these three groups will be on procurement, maternity and child health services, and um, technology standards and the links have been sent to you but we'll also po post um, these in the chat so do join these after the session so we're taking you through all of the areas of change that we think will impact on technology over the next six to twelve months and beyond and then um, we'll be available in the group sessions for you to ask um, some more of your detailed questions um, so we will have two sections for questions uh, and you'll have seen um, the agenda for the day so you know the format and um, do post your questions in the chat um, and I will be picking out these questions to ask to Lord Bethel to Matthew Gould to Tara Donnelly and to Irina Bolcheski um, today. Um, so um, without any further ado, I will hand you on to our first speaker, Tara Donnelly, um, just to give um, Tara an introduction. Tara is the Chief Digital Officer and she spent 32 years in the NHS, we're astonished, uh, um, and she's had a range of senior posts as Chief Executives um, and she's had an interest in digital technology for many years now and many of you have worked with her um, it, within the post she's held within hospitals, uh, within her Chief Executive, the um, uh, academic Health Science Network where she helped set up Digital Health London and with, of course within her current role as Chief Digital Officer. So I'm going to hand over to you Tara. Thanks very much Lisa um, and great to be back again. Um, I'm going to concentrate really in the 10 minutes that I've got in talking about some of the things we've done since we last met in July. So I'm going to focus on four areas uh, Kieran, happy to go to the next slide. Um, and they are um, uh, the AI Award, which you can't have missed, um, which launched on Tuesday. Uh, a bit more about supporting people at home. Um, the work we've been doing on a digital health technology assessment uh, criteria. And then finally, um, ask for your help in mapping the RPA landscape. Great. So, um, I won't talk a great deal about the award itself. We're going to hear more um, about it from Lord Bethel. But I've oh, sorry. Next slide, please, Kieran. Um, I did want to just highlight the kind of range of different examples that have done well um, from this award. Um, just rolling back in time, uh, it was almost exactly a year ago that the AI Lab was announced. 
Um, and there was a real commitment within that, both to take the best and strongest ideas that we're using machine learning and AI in research and get them into the hands of patients and clinicians. Uh, and the reason I'm so excited about where we are now is that this is now happening. So 42 uh, companies were granted an AI award, um, and it's all part of seeking to become a real world leader in the use of this in healthcare. So just to give some examples um, of the winners in the kind of scaling category. So these are these are mature technologies that are ready to be scaled more generally. Um, Healthy IO, that is uh, a technology that turns uh, a smartphone into a clinical grade diagnostic tool. It's able to spot signs of uh, chronic kidney disease in urine samples, and it can really help patients with diabetes not have complications. iRhythm Technologies have a wearable ECG monitoring patch, which is fantastic for picking up difficult to diagnose diseases like atrial fibrillation. And Brainomics um, have been using the brain scans to help um, more quickly process uh, emergency stroke patients in a number of sites, and this will help them scale further. On the next slide, I talk about um, some of the uh, companies that are at earlier stage. They are starting their first real world test. Uh, Chiron, um, which is a British um, brain cancer scan company um, that's been doing great work uh, up in um, the Midlands um, with a big consortium there trying to improve the accuracy of, um, of scanning for breast cancer. IBEX, which does a similar thing, but for prostate biopsy slides. Um, and ECHO, which is a smart stethoscope that also records an ECG while it's doing that. This is getting great feedback um, from primary care colleagues at the moment. Um, and then finally, Oxford Heartbeat, which um, helps around high risk brain surgery. And I think just looking across those examples, it gives a hint of the uh, the real depth and breadth of these innovations and how they can make a really practical difference to patients on the ground. So we're delighted at NHSX that we are able to be part, um, working with a whole bunch of other partners such as NIH, NHI, N, <laughs> NIHR and the AAC um, in awarding these really important critical bits of pump priming to get these products out to more people. Um, and what's next for the AI lab is that um, we've also recently, on the next slide, um, we've put out a comprehensive buyer's guide to AI to help people who are purchasing uh, these tools, including the top 10 questions that commissioners need to ask. We'll be having a, an event if people would like to know more about the AI award on Thursday, the 24th of September. You'd be most welcome to attend that. Um, and uh, if you'd like to read more about the work and find out about how to um, get more involved, please look on our uh, specific web pages on the NHSX website, which say a great deal more than I will be able to in my few minutes. Um, on the next slide, I move on to supporting people at home. So this is a really important part of our joining up care work. Uh, um, so on the slide, it talks about three sections. I'm going to talk about the middle bit about supporting people at home. Um, next slide, please, Kieran. And last time we mentioned that the, we would have this focus on joining up care, that we wanted to make the most of this big shift to digital health um, services that has also impacted um, care homes during the pandemic and hold on to those gains and build on them. So we're partnering with regional teams to scale digital innovations that enable remote monitoring to better support people manage their own care from home. So very linked to our citizen facing goals at NHSX. And what we've been doing since we last met is that teams across regions have been working with those, their localities to select those priorities that chime with their particular needs in, in their patch um, and to bid to us for implementation funding to support that. As many of us know, often it's not the technology that's the tricky bit, it's the change management to make the most of it. So based on that evidence, this is our approach. Um, so regional teams have been completing bids and pitched to a panel of NHSX uh, teams um, chaired by Matthew just a few weeks ago and I'm delighted that all bids have been supported and the schemes are kicking off this month. And we're at the final stages of evaluation of a new um, dynamic purchasing system, Spark DPS, in support of remote care. Uh, and us having done a very detailed evaluation nationally will really help uh, NHS and social care organisations select digital products. Selection can then happen quite compliantly within about three weeks rather than three to six months.
Um, and uh, it, it, the next slide sort of just shows this as a bit of a jigsaw, the four components. So there's the regional scale plans that I, sorry, next slide please, Kieran. Um, there's the regional scale plans I just mentioned. Um, there's the simplifying access to solutions, which is the procurement uh, exercise, but also we've um, been successful in bidding for some COVID monies to help support um, for this year only license costs as well. The third component is the innovation collaboratives. Um, so we're putting support mechanisms in for these groups of adopters. We're building a community of practice. We're sharing resources. We're doing everything we can to try and help accelerate spread. Um, we ran a big event on Tuesday um, for people who wanted to uh, learn about the virtual ward for COVID monitoring um, and would like to put that in place themselves. Um, and we will be giving support to local systems consistently. And then the fourth dimension is about the digital outpatient pathway. Um, work to really reimagine outpatient pathways to be digitally supported. Um, significant involvement from key stakeholders such as the Royal Colleges and the clinical directors and looking at the very ultra high volume specialties. Uh, and if you'd be interested in finding out more about this, there's a specific workshop on it later. And there's also one on procurement as well, if that is more your bag. Next slide, please. So just to finish off on um, remote, I think I might, I think I might have missed my Derek chap. Yeah. Okay, um, so it, Implementation teams, we will be, we'll be reinforcing local teams with the staff that they need and running those innovation collaboratives we spoke about. Um, and given that for over 400,000 people, their home is a care home, we are also looking at strongly supporting care home residents through digital health tools, which is a particularly exciting development. Um, we are very soon going to start communicating the patient benefits of remote monitoring. That work's going to kick off next week, so do look out for it. Next slide, please. So um, we talked about this a bit last time, but just to recap, because conscious that not everybody will have been part of this journey with us, but um, we uh, we had a really strong message from the marketplace that the existing approach didn't really offer the clear route to market that people were looking for. And we consulted earlier this year, in fact, just as the pandemic broke um, on a draft digital health standard. And we got a good bit of feedback for that and MedCity kindly helped collate that. We've listened very carefully to those messages. Um, and what was said very consistently, actually, is that the approach needs to be proportionate and provide an appropriate benchmark for innovators in the healthcare ecosystem to be able to use. And it needs to be as simple as possible. Um, so we've taken that on board. Um, sorry, next slide, please, Kieran. Um, and we will be uh, publishing a more focused criteria for the assessment of digital health services later on this month. And we'll publish that on the NHSX website. And it covers the assessment criteria for the critical elements um, and those that can be measured completely objectively. That's clinical safety, regulatory compliance, technical assurance, data protection, usability and accessibility. And we'll be publishing a roadmap detailing the process when it will be open for different types of products. We're also staying really close to the really interesting looking developing work of the ICO, the International uh, Organization for Standardization, um, uh, because we're very keen to link to international standards where we can. Um, and um, next please Kieran if you'd like to know more about this aspect there is also a workshop on this topic too. Um, a number of benefits I won't go through each of them because time um, doesn't really allow but we do believe that this is a much more effective way um, of opening up the marketplace. Um, we will continue to um, uh, to um, surface patient facing apps on the NHS app store, but we're also looking to get them right into the condition pages on nhs.uk. That's where the very high volume of inquiries come from. And we think if we promote digital alternatives there, that will be super helpful. Um, digital innovators will need to demonstrate they can meet the criteria. They may do that themselves or they could seek support from commercially available app assessment organisations to help. And then evidence will be assessed by subject experts and will provide the final tick off. And the NHS digital process will come to a close as planned at the end of September. Then moving finally to robotic process automation. So this is all about um, opportunities for automating back-end tasks, patient registration, finances, HR, and starting to move into areas of helping clinical operations too. Um, you may have seen um, Maddie uh, in our team did a fantastic recent blog on this, 
Um, and as part of this work, we want to really understand both the strengths uh, in the system and the opportunities and barriers to adoption uh, in health and social care of RPA. So please complete our survey. Uh, it runs till Monday the 5th of October. Um, and we're also um, gathering case studies. So if you're a great example of RPA in action, please do share yours with us at the feedback email address that we uh, commonly use. Um, I'll stop there, given, given time, but that's just a bit of a canter through really some of the four of the big areas um, that we've been uh, working on with the latest updates for you. Thank you. Hand back to Lisa. I think he's introducing you right now. Thank you. That was fantastic. Great, and it's um, wonderful to hear all those um, initiatives that are happening. Um, so I know a couple of you posted questions. Please carry on posting your questions. And, and I'm thrilled to have our next speaker, Irina Bolcheski. So Irina has been on a lifelong mission to improve um, uh, data and standards, and we're really pleased to have her uh, talking about her work here. So Irina has been at NHSX only a short period of time, but has grappled with um, figuring out the NHS really quickly. So Irene is the Director of Standards and Interoperability, so she's got quite a task on her hand um, and she's previously worked for the Open Knowledge Foundation, the Open Data Institute, co-founded uh, Decentralised, which is an advocacy group promoting um, decentralised techniques, so really skilled um, in this area. And um, I just looked up your Wikipedia and you're a data expert and activist, um, Irene. I loved that. So I'm um, really pleased to uh, have you speaking today. So over to Irina. Thank you very much, Lisa. Goodness, I uh, should have gone and secretly edited my uh, Wikipedia page if I'd known um, that I would get such a wonderful um, intro. Right, so uh, if we go to the next slide, I am part of the Technology Strategy and Innovation Division within NHSX, so sort of the CTO team. And we're really kind of responsible for the technology strategy to help deliver and enable the ambitions of the long term plan and tech vision. And we're really interested in kind of providing a very enabling role to look, to look at those kind of building blocks of services and platforms and APIs and standards that can actually really help drive innovation. And across um, across the team, we have enterprise architecture platforms. Um, standards in interoperability, skunk works and cybersecurity. And um, all of us, as well as the, the CTO, are really um, interested in working with organisations from across the health and care sector and industry partners to really inform our approach and um, make sure that we can kind of deliver on some of these things. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, there are lots of different standards and mechanisms already in place, so hopefully some of these things won't be um, won't be new. We've obviously published information standards notices, so new standards um, uh, like the uh, maternity and child health um, that Nian will be talking about in the breakout sessions um, are an ISN, and uh, as well as data collections that we kind of expect uh, people to conform to. There are um, professional record standards body standards such as the core information standard that helps kind of inform that kind of core clinical model for things like uh, the like programs and the shared care records um, as well and then obviously kind of usability and kind of best practice standards for the NHS service uh, design manual which has an interoperability point 17 kind of looking at what, what we should do in terms of using things like NHS number and SNOMED CT and um, kind of HSSF, which also will be in the breakout session with Dean um, in the kind of procurement section, also assesses standards. So there's lots of kind of different ways in which um, companies that can be sort of NHS ready and, and can kind of look at standards. And if we go to the next slide, uh, there are also lots of services already in place to actually help provide some of those building blocks for not having to start from scratch. And um, if we go to the next slide, what I've kind of been thinking about since I joined just at the start of lockdown. So um, many of my colleagues have uh, also only seen me like this. They probably know more about my board game collection than 
you know how tall I am. Uh, so it's a, it's kind of a new new way of uh, working. One of the things that I've been doing since I've joined is really listening, talking to a lot of people about some of the blockers and challenges, and trying to think back about how do we really ensure tangible pen, um, patient benefits and clinician benefits. You know, how do we make sure that the elderly patient who's had to kind of repeat their end of life preferences five times to different teams doesn't need to go through that again. And so what I've uh, thought about is all of the different kind of objectives that we might care about and how does that relate to a standards and interoperability approach. So if we go to the next slide, um, what I have decided that we really need to focus on in this directorate is making sure that standards are widely adopted. We have a lot of great standards and that also we're looking to make sure that standards are fit for purpose. They fill a particular need. In my experience, more standards aren't always better. You know, we have a lot of great standards and a standard by itself is just, uh, you know, some text or symbols on a server somewhere. And we really need to ensure that these standards do get adopted to realise the benefits that we care about. So to that end, um, if we go to the next slide, some of the things that uh, we're doing is really looking to kind of put in place an enabling framework to help support that. And that's looking at ensuring that standards are open, maintained, usable and accessible, that they're patient focused and defined by users and that we do develop them in consultation with vendors, implementers and especially the open source community that we want to support and that we test them in reality and base them on actual behaviours that are happening now. And also that we really focus on that adoption piece and provide clarity on what exists, what's the scope, because as, as you, un, you probably uh, understand, there are lots of different types of standards, everything from uh, cybersecurity to usability, and even within the interoperability, there's everything from terminology, vocabularies, reference data sets, to messaging, um, to kind of core clinical models and how do we actually really provide what kind of what um, do we want um, people to do and to, to what level in uh, in which sectors and I'd like to really kind of kick off a whole range of work to make that kind of compliance really easy and ensure that what we do have we enforce really systematically and consistently across all of the different sort of frameworks and levers that we have. So if we go to the next slide, um, some of so this is sort of like a sneak peek at the uh, at the standards and interoperability strategy. So what what I'm thinking and um, your feedback would be very welcome is really focusing on sort of four main strands of work around developing and improving standards, making sure they're sort of fit, fit, uh, fit for purpose, establishing sort of feedback cycles and having more formal processes about how we actually develop standards and um, what process they go through and actually deprecating legacy standards so that we, we don't sort of have standard proliferation, making it really easy to use standards. One of the things that I've heard is um, that actually having some kind of knowledge base around implementation guidance and tooling would be incredibly valuable and just providing clarity and roadmap and a roadmap for where we're going and working together with um, suppliers and innovators to sort of um, plan that in as time goes on. Lots of engagement and comms again to kind of really drive that forward and aligning our levers and incentives. So if we go to the next slide, um, so a lot of this work will be supported by a whole range of new roles. So four of them are mentioned here. Uh, so I will be hiring and there will be also kind of posts available in the CTO office. So um, please look out for those and uh, it should be a really great team. And we're also kind of really trying to stay flexible and think about how do we be more open, be more inclusive and collaborative and really kind of bring things back to that benefit. Uh, user-centered focus, uh, thinking about metrics and baselining, showing showing the benefits that um, we're delivering, and also having a more sort of structural strategic approach. What can NHSX do to kind of really enable um, standards uh, to, to help uh, innovators get involved, but also help 
um, the health and care sectors to kind of use technology to to meet their needs. Right, so next slide, although I think I've sort of talked a little bit about this. So some of the things that I think are relevant um, to this context of what this looks like in practice is actually having starting to bring together some of the different places where we publish standards or work on standards into a kind of catalog or library, publishing a standards roadmap and starting to develop a kind of knowledge base around implementation and work with people to kind of contribute to that so we can actually have a shared sort of almost community of practice around standards and interoperability and, and how we work on these things. Uh, so next slide. The, so that's kind of standards and interoperability. And the other thing I wanted to mention is from my colleague Emma was around skunk works. So this is this is a division within CTO that's sort of testing tomorrow's technology today. Um, I'm very jealous about that tagline and it's really looking at kind of what sort of disruptive promising technology that exists that isn't yet widely adopted in health. Um, finding opportunities to actually apply that at scale to address challenging problems. Um, next slide please. So there's a range of ways to get involved in that. Um, Emma's planning to do a lot of user research and kind of have an ideas bank to sort of uh, find problems to address and uh, specific use cases and there will be a whole range of kind of hackathons to get involved in so she's looking at kind of um, ideas around eliminating typing you can get in touch with her using that email address or get in touch with her on twitter and next slide um, oh i thought i deleted this anyway one of the things that i think we are all quite passionate on is making sure that we actually do have an open approach and that we we sort of support open ways of working, open standards, and also see where we can um, uh, foster kind of open source um, technology. Next slide, which I think is the last slide. So there's lots of, we've kind of had some discussions and ideas about what we can do and how we can support um, innovation in health technology. So we'd love to kind of know you know what what we could be doing as a team in terms of documenting standards or, or standards or filling standards gaps um, putting in place platforms or apis or services to kind of help provide some of those building blocks and what what would you uh, value i you know we've kind of had discussions around having sort of sandbox environments where um we can test that so that's something that hopefully uh, you can hear more of as we kind of flesh those out. And I think that is it from me. Thank you, Irina. Great, it's wonderful to have that. And uh, we have about 10 minutes now for questions. Um, so we know that uh, it is really difficult sometimes working with the NHS and we need to help innovators as much as possible. So we, we're really aware of that. Um, and we've got some fantastic questions that people have posted that really get to the to the to the depths of that. So um, so the first um, questions um, are is what there's one around RPA, which I'm going to pose to, to Rod. Um, uh, Rod Joyce, um, you will know, uh, a lot of colleagues will know he's one of our uh, team members and he's uh, presented on a number of these events. Um, so the question is, are there clinical safety considerations with RPA, which often uses screen scraping um, and is not as robust as APIs? Rod, what would you answer to that? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, um, it's a very good point. Um, we understand that there is a huge opportunity with RPA, but we do understand that there's a, a clinical safety angle to that that we need to ensure that we support. Um, we understand that RPA offers a significant op opportunity. Um, there's a lot of process automation that happens to really support the workforce. Where it starts to um, cross over into um, clinical efficiencies, we know that there's additional work and effort that needs to be done to ensure that these processes are safe and robust and fit for everybody. Um, but we do see RPA as a good opportunity. There are some really good test beds out there, some good examples of, of things that are happening, uh, whether that's back end support, whether that's um, COVID reporting and started to look at how it can support clinical coding and various other things. So we'd welcome all those questions and welcome all that feedback. Um, I've posted Maddie's 
I hope she doesn't mind. I have posted Maddie's email in the chat as a response to one of the questions around RPA. Um, please do get in touch. Please do fill in the survey and we're looking forward to, to determining from that survey where we go next with RPA and how we can support trusts and CCGs sort of implement the things that they want to do to give time back to people to be able to um, focus on you know the, the the things we need to do that um, the humans can do better than, than robots and robots can do better than humans. Wonderful Rod and don't go anywhere because I've got another question for <laughs> So, which is how can we become an assessor org for apps? What's the process? And sure, we'll um, there was one other RPA question which I'll quickly touch on. Uh, we're very much like an RPA at the moment. There's a huge amount of other things around automation. Um, this We see this very much as the first step in what we're doing around RPA and automation. So again, please do contact Maddie if you are, uh, if you are um, more involved in some of the uh, more advanced types of automation that, that are out there and exist already. We're, we're keen to hear everything. Um, secondly, yes, around the assessment criteria, you know, we um, my, my best advice would be come to the session on tech standards immediately after this, um, where we'll have the opportunity to discuss it a bit further. But we will be communicating very openly um, with regards to the next phase. Um, we want to ensure that we provide innovators with the right support and that there are you know, a significant number of companies we think that can help provide that out in the market. Um, so yeah, we will be communicating. Um, we'll make sure that everybody who's obviously on this event is also communicated to. So yeah, look out for some comms, but we are keen to get people um, who, are in, who want to be involved in assessing apps um, involved and creating that dynamic marketplace. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so um, a few more questions. Uh, so the next question is around supporting innovators who are tackling the digital divide and equality access um, to healthcare. And I'm going to come to Tara and to Irina just uh, for their thoughts on how uh, how we're supporting that particular question. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. And, and people probably know that we have done work over recent years exactly on this and have pr produced a toolkit um, that was uh, the, the Good Things Foundation uh, worked with us over a couple of years uh, to demonstrate the best practice in thinking about digital inclusion locally. Um, we That work continues. It continues under our pillar that's about empowering the citizen um, and um, it's it's absolutely critical. Some really interesting things are happening as well in that space at the moment. So people might have seen that Crisis has linked up with um, Tesco Mobile to provide thousands of devices to homeless people. Well, wouldn't it be interesting to have a health version of that, for example? So it's they're, they're questions that we're thinking about very carefully because we've seen a seismic shift in how people are accessing uh, through the digital means and we want to make sure nobody is left behind in that in that journey at all. Um, it is really interesting to see some of the stats. So there's been something like a so in terms of people over 55 uh, using the internet to order things during the pandemic compared to before um, that the, the figures have changed exponentially. So one of our um, strong feelings is that the public has been extraordinarily accommodating of this shift to digital when there is a massive upset side. Um, historically, when surveys have been done about would you rather see your doctor face to face, um, that scores very, very highly. We know there have been situations in the pandemic where people have been asked to come in by their GP and they've refused. Now, that's not good either, um, but there is a whole shift going on in people's kind of appreciation um, for what remote monitoring um, can bring. Um, one of my slides that didn't come up was a, telling a story about a, a gentleman who has his warfarin managed completely at home. Um, and and when they surveyed that group of patients uh, about which they preferred, would they recommend that to a friend? Um, that 100 percent of people would. So that's a net promoter score that, you know, even even the big tech companies would be super envious of because that people are appreciating that being able to do that at home is freeing them from expensive car journeys, repeated um, car parking charges or public transport. So it, it's it's such a different world. Um, I think this digital inclusion um, piece is incredibly important, uh, but I'd be really interested in, um, in in linking up and learning from what some of the charities are doing uh, on this. And Irina, sorry, over to you. 
Yeah, no, I, I think that that's that's exactly right. And I just sort of to pick up on sort of Lucy's point about accessibility. Like, I think one of the things that we're very keen on is obviously that technology meets um, W3C kind of accessibility standards, um, AA and AAA, so, and that's part of the, of, um, the uh, HSSF, HSSF framework. But also, I think one of the things that I'm really interested in is starting to think about what is a good process for developing standards and making sure that part of that process is kind of actually engagement and user research and thinking about you know, what is it that people are doing kind of on the front line and how how would these standards actually interact with what people physically need to do and the kind of pa patient pathways and clinical pathways that we, we have to make sure that um, we, we have a kind of representative and uh, uh, kind of technology standards that, that, that um, are inclusive. Fantastic, that's really helpful. and, and and um, I'm sure there's a lot more to say on that and we can we can pick that up in discussions afterwards. Um, so there's a couple of questions which I thought I would um, just very um, quickly answer. The first one is, are there jobs at NHS X? Um, uh, absolutely, there, we advertise all of our jobs on NHS uh, uh, on NHS jobs. So please do look them up on that uh, website uh, and we are advertising at the moment. And the second one was around where um, innovators from abroad, if they wanted to start collaborating with the NHS, how could they um, do this? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask one of my colleagues to put links to the Academic Health Science Networks in the chat because um, these are the agencies that will help you do that. They are the agencies that um, talk people through how to link with the NHS, um, put you in touch with um, uh, people within organisations to, to help you um, to do that. And we'll talk through the systems and structures in great detail um, within the NHS, all the information you need. They're very experienced at uh, doing that and they run um, digital accelerators. So we're very um, happy to help um, people with that. Um, so we're going to move um, on to our next speaker, uh, Matthew Gould. I'll just um, uh, give you a, a little bit of background on Matthew. Um, so Matthew is our, our chief executive and joins us uh, from um, the um, Department for Digital um, Culture, uh, Media uh, and Sport. Um, where he was Director General. He's no stranger to difficult jobs and challenges, and he's been um, lead for cybersecurity uh, and uh, um, a leading light in the Foreign Office. So we're pleased that um, um, following having the pleasure of being the British Ambassador to Israel, that he's returned to the UK and is now working with us at NHS X. Um, thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, thank you, and uh, hello, everyone. And I think I am both your next speaker, but also the fill in till Lord Bethel arrives. So when he does, uh, if you let me know, I'll shut up and let him speak. Um, I hope everyone's heard some key messages today and I really wanted to sort of underline a few of them. Uh, first of all, real pride in the progress that collectively we've made over the last six months, emphatically in a partnership uh, between different organisations at the centre, us, NHS Digital, NHS BSA, the NHS Frontline and the Social Care Frontline and the tech sector. And I think between us, not everything's gone right. There are some legitimate gripes. There's some stuff we need to fix. There's some stuff we need to build on and do better. But we have made a degree of progress that would have been unimaginable six months ago from the shift to remote consultations as the norm, the, the massive stepping up of remote working, the uh, escalation of uh, NHS login, the more than 7 million people who looked at, uh, watched videos on our health at home site, the, the better flow of data across the system, for example, in uh, GP Connect and um, uh, the additional information in the summary care records. Uh, I think we've made real progress and, uh, and I'll come on to how we build on that, but I think collectively it's been a sort of remarkable achievement. Um, the second message is I hope you you uh, you have a uh, clock that we are trying very hard to listen to your concerns. So, for example, I know colleagues have been talking about the standard for the assessment of, of digital pro health products uh, and the fact that we have taken on board the very clear messages 
that you gave us and uh, responding to them with a better, lighter, more appropriate standard shows we are determined to try and get this right. And it's going to be a, a, an iterative process with you. Um, and we are working hard to try and respond to the things that you've told us in these sessions that are your priorities. The creation of open standards, as Irina and Rod have been talking about, the creation of new and uh, better procurement frameworks, uh, the way we've done the AI lab and the AI awards that have just been announced. We've tried very hard to incorporate the feedback, the priorities, the things that you've told us are important. Um, now, I think the challenge is to to build on the past six months, to uh, work out where we need to uh, sort of really, I don't like the phrase lock in, it's a bit too static, but lock in the improvements and build on them and focus on some of the gaps that the last six months have, uh, I think, really highlighted. I, one of those gaps which has been highlighted very clearly is the gap between health and social care. And so we've, uh, we prioritised what we're doing so we can give uh, top priority to a set of really sort of three objectives which we call joining up care, um, which are, I mean, uh, th three elements. First of all, it's making sure the entire country has shared care records uh, built according to sort of standards of interoperability that allow data to safely and appropriately flow between care providers in health and in care. There are some really good examples of where this is happening already, so we know it can be done. We know it's partly about tech, but more about more about people and systems, and we want to see everyone reaching a, a basic standard there so that we know that across the country patient data is flowing to where it's needed for uh, to, to look after patients best. I think the second element is trying to raise levels of digitization and digital capability in the social care sector specifically uh, because it's quite hard for that data to flow. It's quite hard to tear down the barriers using digital technology if, as we know, a third of social care providers are um, uh, fully digitized, a third are partly digitized, and a third are still using paper for everything. Uh, so, for example, we've piloted and now we're going to roll out much more widely, giving uh, tablets to, uh, to, to care homes. Uh, we've worked with the telecoms companies to improve connectivity, and we're looking at skills, uh, innovation, at the systems that they use to try and really step up their capability. Third element is um, uh, remote monitoring, which I know Tara has been talk talked about, but which has the most enormous potential to transform the way that we deliver care and the relationship between the citizens, social care providers and health providers, if we can get it right. And we're working hard with many of you and we're across the uh, NHS to try and scale that at speed. And then I think that all collectively needs to be underpinned by um, some real clarity around um, uh, how we operate. Um, we've got a project which we call What Good Looks Like, which sets out, as the name suggests, standards around what different sorts of health and care providers need to do in digital uh, digital transformation. We've got another project which is also similarly titled, which is called Who Pays For What? So we can finally give some clarity to uh, what what the uh, different providers and systems can expect of the centre, but what they should be looking to fund themselves in digital. We can do much better and we're going to do much better at providing clarity around information governance and how uh, data can be shared with confidence through really simple guidance that's endorsed by all the key players. And I mean, fundamentally, and with this I'll shut up and pass over to Lord Bethel, um, our goal is to provide an innovation, uh, a platform for innovation. We're never going to be able to, and we shouldn't aspire to do the innovation centrally. We need to provide a platform so that you can, whether it's through the NHS app, uh, allowing some really uh, uh, straightforward ways for innovators to dock into it, whether it's through NHS login, uh, whether it's through uh, the way that we, uh, the systems we set up to allow clinicians to access uh, AI and uh, proven systems there. I think the 
best, most effective thing we can do is continue to identify ways that we provide a platform for you, underpinned by standards, clarity on data, proper data flows and incentives that all push in the right direction. For this to work, you're going to need to continue to tell us what you need and where we're getting it wrong. Um, many of you have been uh, extremely vocal at doing this and I'm very grateful because it allows us to, to keep iterating and keep getting it right. So thank you. Thank you for engaging. And with that, uh, I can pass over to, to Lord Bethel. Thank you. I thought I would just take a moment to introduce Lord Bethel. We're delighted to, to have him here. So uh, Lord Bethel is the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State and Minister for Innovation and his uh, leads and interests are medicines and testing, treatment and vaccine, life sciences, medical research, data and technology and the lead for cyber security. So a really relevant and wide breadth of, of, um, of work and we're, we're thrilled to, to have you here. Thank you Lord Bethel. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you for the very kind in introduction, but you forgot to mention raving, which is my other big interest in life. Um, I, I'm incredibly pleased to be uh, on this round table. I, I am the Minister for Innovation and um, and we do see one of the benefits of this horrible, horrible disease is the potential for having a huge inflection point in the adoption of innovation in uh, the healthcare system. And um, that's what I really want to talk about. Um, and I want to I want to start by saying a really big thank you to everyone uh, who's on this call. Um, everyone who's worked in who works in digital tech companies, because you have been a massive, massive support to us throughout the uh, pandemic. The NHS has continued to be for there for us and along with clinicians and frontline health staff. A massive credit goes to our healthcare, uh, our digital health um, partners who have helped. And let me give you a, a couple of examples. Uh, you've helped us, helped our patients and citizens connect with health professionals, carers and loved ones from pledges of smartphones and tablets to video consultation and remote monitoring technologies. And, and I had a showcase uh, last week, a fantastic uh, app for people who had um, COVID where they could um, put a dongle on the end of their finger and measure the um, oxygen in their blood, um, which meant that they could stay at home reassured that should their condition decline, uh, clinicians would be onto it immediately uh, and, and could call them in if necessary. Um, you've also helped our frontline NHS staff to stay connected and supported from broadband and phone offers to digital assistance with essential shopping and travel. And you've helped to swiftly find solutions to problems the pandemic poses to our health care and well-being through pledges of resources uh, and expertise. So a massive and heartfelt thanks to your efforts, goodwill and ongoing support as we, we really, really couldn't have done it without you. I've seen at first hand the innovation that the private sector working together with the public sector can bring. And um, the uh, work I've been doing on test and trace is a really good example. I could not have believed uh, in March the rate of innovation that has gone on in testing in terms of speed, accuracy, price and sheer scale of uh, testing. You know, we were doing two or three thousand a day and we're doing two or three hundred thousand a day at the moment. And I can have I have in mind that we can see a day when we might do two or three million a day. I mean, that is an absolutely incredible turnaround and pay and is all about uh, innovators stepping up to a huge challenge. But I am alive to the changes to the way in which um, working and culture across the NHS and social care, uh, the, dig the digital shift is brought. And we need to harness that and bake in the benefits for the long term. As we head into winter, planning for COVID re recovery and beyond, I am and I will continue to champion digitization as a vital part of planning, delivering personalization of good care and support right across the NHS and social care. We've learned a lot through COVID and we need to build on that. We need to increase the use of digital channels, support people to have safe and high quality care where they live, but at the same time address inequalities and digital exclusion and access and act on the gaps between services so people can have 
frictionless experiences. As you heard from previous speakers, there are many local examples of real progress and innovation across the country that bring health and social care services more closely together to support those they care for. And the NHS is working with councils, local NHS services, the social care sector and industry to connect care providers with the NHS. We are supporting care providers to adopt the infrastructure and technology needed to deliver fast and reliable access to digital health services. And this includes improving unreliable internet connectivity and poor digital infrastructure in care homes and across care providers to alleviate inequality and missed opportunities for harnessing digital tools that personalize and improve the direct care of some of our most vulnerable citizens. We have an ambitious task to enable the sharing of care records across health and social care. NHS Mail has rolled out to more than 11,000 care settings, enabling better and safer communication with local health officials. Next, we'll give staff fast access to the accurate and up-to-date information they need to provide safe, informed, direct care and make care and treatment decisions. This will reduce the time burden too, giving staff time back to spend on delivering care. And what about supporting people at home? Here you'll see tech supporting a bolder move to digitally enable personalised healthcare, delivering at the right time in the right place. From online and video consultations to regional scale plans for remote monitoring and virtual wards, supporting many people to manage their care from home wherever they live, especially those with long term conditions. I'd like to pause a moment to say a few words about the impact of remote monitoring on families. Many of us who have relatives who need expert health advice and would prefer to stay in their home, their own home when they receive this. And I know this from my own personal experience. My auntie Susanna, who lives in uh, Edinburgh, is very passionate about staying in her home in Edinburgh. Uh, and uh, uh, I have the uh, scars on my back uh, of the battles to try and move her and she ain't going anywhere. So anything uh, the tech industry can do to support auntie Susanna is massively appreciated. And the devices and technologies that are being implemented help clinical teams see the results of vital signs of patients and support uh, their care at home. This also gives patients and their families greater knowledge of how they're progressing and they are aware if they are within expected parameters for their condition. Patients have fed back that it is reassuring to have more information on their condition, to know when the clinical teams have reviewed their results and that their care will be escalated promptly if needed. I have experience of caring for my elderly relatives and I know that they'll benefit from remote monitoring of digital services. I'm delighted that practical support from the NHS, NHS X team includes establishing procurement routes that make it fast and easy for the NHS and social care to select suitable digital products locally. For example, NHS X has recently developed and published a new clinical communications tool framework it makes it easier for staff, trusts and commissioners to use product solutions and software from a range of approved supplies that, meet, that best meet their needs. This is an exciting opportunity for secondary care to enhance multidisciplinary team working. To kickstart the introduction of these modern communications tools, NHSX has secured £3 million to cover some of the licence costs in the first 12 months. And I've just paid personal testimony to everyone involved in that, in that uh, project. It's really valuable and I know it was a huge amount of work to get going. And in the outpatient setting, we are reimagining care pathways so they are strongly digitally supported with patients and systems being able to make full use of the advances in digital platforms and devices to receive their care at home, supported by clinical teams who can review their progress. We've started developing digital pathways in cardiology, ophthalmology, dermatology, mus musculoskeletal, cancer and respiratory care. This is the start of new ways of delivering personalised tech care, supporting people in their homes. I was also delighted that the 42 winners of the first round of the AI in Health and Care Awards were announced last week. AI technologies have been selected to receive a share of the first £50 million will help personalise NHS screening and treatments for cancer and eye disease, speed up stroke care and turn mobile phones in into a monitor to detect irregular heartbeats. Throughout our history, the NHS has led the way in designing, developing and introducing cutting edge technology. The innovations we're funding 
have the potential to transform how we deliver services to patients right across the country. The potential of AI is vast, and through the NHS AI Lab, we are accelerating a safe adoption of world-leading data-driven technology that meets the aims of the long-term plan. We have freshly produced an AI buyer's guide for AI in health and social care. You can find it on, the, on NHSX's AI Lab web pages. It identifies 10 questions commissioners should consider when looking at adopting AI technology so that they can have more confidence in doing so. There will be further rounds of applications to the AI fund for the hundreds of innovators with ideas which they wish to put into practice in the NHS and in social care. But this is just the start of some of the biggest changes we've seen in health and medical developments in decades. Finally, I'm working to ensure that through global collaboration in areas like cloud-based services, clinical research, data-driven technologies and AI, we provide future opportunities for innovators such as yourselves to operate within a vibrant UK health and care technology industry and to export our services and products around the world. So we're there to help you. We're enormously grateful for the efforts you've made and I'm really looking forward to the discussion we're about to have. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lord Bethel. So we've got um, uh, some time for questions and we've, we've certainly got a lot of questions around um, how um, organisations work together. So for some of these, what I might do is bring Matthew in to say a little bit more about how we how we work together with the CQC and other organisations, um, but also um, leave some time for, uh, for you to to um, add your thoughts to those. So um, so the first question is, who is leading the dedicated dedicated health and social care strategy on the back of the national strategy for data launch yesterday. So I'll come to to Matthew uh, first and uh, uh, if you want to, to add your comments, Matthew. Um, yeah, so. Um, Can't hear Matthew. Oh. Oh. Can you hear me now? Hello. Yes, I can. Great, excellent. Um, so. I mean, inevitably, because of the number of organisations that are involved in in both uh, digital technology and data at the centre and at the front line, it's a collaborative effort. So we work incredibly hard with NHS Digital and NHS BSA. Um, as the Secretary of State has said previously, uh, the, the division of labour is a fairly straightforward one. NHSX is the sort of guiding strategic mind at the centre that we hold the budgets, we do the commissioning and um, NHS Digital together with NHS BSA are the core uh, delivery partners. So they lay down the tracks on which uh, technology runs. And then there are bunches of other uh, partners as well. So in data, for example, uh, colleagues in NHS England, uh, an improvement, uh, the CQC and others are all involved. And actually we've been sitting down with them and discussing how we can do a better job at uh, collecting data efficiently, reducing the data collection burden on the front line and sharing data effectively uh without um, uh, uh, breaching or disrespecting patient confidentiality um the system that has evolved over time needs improving the burden that we're currently placing on the front line is too great and so i think there is work to do but the great thing from my perspective is i've been convening a series of meetings with all the, the sort of key organizations uh, across the different bodies that I've mentioned and key people and I think we're very much aligned about what we want to do and how we want to do it. Uh, further details to follow. Thank you Matthew. Lord Bethel, anything to add on that? Well Ma Matthew put it really well. I mean the only thing I would say is that there's been my my impression is that one of the things COVID has done is to give people a lot of permission to share data in ways that they might have hesitated about before. And there's been more data shared in recent months than, than previously. And no one wants to go back to the old old ways and no one has been hurt by the data that has been shared. And so I'm really encouraged that a lot of progress has been made on this agenda. And I'm really optimistic that we can keep going forward on it. 
Wonderful, thank you. So the next questions are a group of questions on how organisations work together and how we can make things more accessible um, to, to people. So the first one is around um, the role for regulators, the CQC and local authorities in enforcing standards. Are we engaging with those? And I'll come to Matthew first, but I'm just going to um, put in another couple of questions and perhaps we can answer them all at the same time. Um, so the emerging work looks robust, um, but we want to hear more on accessibility and support for patients is critical for community partners um, uh, and people with disabilities. Um, how do we work with um, uh, innovators to support people with disabilities? Um, and uh, and, and a, uh, another question on, um, do you think with rapid adoption of technology during COVID-19, this will make interoperability harder with increased number of influencers on the scene? So I just want, if I'll go to Matthew first and then yourself, Lord Bethel, just for, for uh, initial views. Um, so um, let me take quickly take each of those in turn. Um, I think the regulation, I would say, is a work in progress. Uh, so one of the things I did before the pandemic was convene the chief execs of all the regulators and bodies involved in uh, the space, particularly in, around AI and data driven technologies in health to come up with a common plan for how we get appropriate, uh, proportionate, effective regulation in place. Uh, and and we're, I, I think it's fair to say we're not there yet, uh, but together with um, MHRA and NICE and many others, I think we had 17 organisations around the table. We know we need to do this and we need to do this urgently in order to provide a sort of safe, uh, and positive environment for innovators to be able to deploy technology. Uh, so look, it's it's a work in progress, um, uh, but I think everyone knows we need to do it and we have a, a plan and we're committed to it. Uh, the point around uh, support for patients and accessibility is exactly right. I think we are still seeing and working out the impact of the massive and quick shift of to digital channels on uh, uh, digital exclusion and different communities and groups of citizens. And I think it's absolutely incumbent on us all, uh, centre uh, innovators, NHS Frontline and others, to make sure that as we go down this route, we've always got in mind those people who uh, can't access digital technology, don't have the means, aren't comfortable with it or for whatever reason uh, don't want to go down this route with us and make sure we provide non-digital alternatives that are as good or we provide them ways of getting access uh, to the digital technologies that work for them. Um, we've made sure that we have uh, patient voice representatives in NHSX from our senior leadership team down. So uh, it, it, it's really important that they hold us to account and you make sure that uh, we're doing this. Um, finally, on the interoperability. Yeah, I mean, it, there is a real danger of doing stuff at pace that you create tech debt at the same time because you're trying so hard to do the primary purpose that uh, you don't build in the standards and the foundation for making it interoperable in the future. We are trying very hard to square that circle and work out how we can do both, but it's not straightforward given the pace of what what it, we have to do and the scale of what we have to do. Thank you, Matthew. Lord Bethel, any comments on those questions? Uh, Matthew put it all very well. I think that um, my only, you know, the, the political dimension is 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 very simple. The public expect us to look after everyone in the country. Uh, not just the ones who happen to have a nice snazzy mobile phone. So we have to we have to uh, step up to the challenge of uh, the digitally disenfranchised and to reach out to to everyone, whatever their uh, um, access capability is. That said, uh, digital does offer opportunities for reaching audiences that, that the healthcare system currently doesn't reach very well. And we've seen that a little bit in mental health. I think it's really, in, I, I am really interested to see the post-match analysis of COVID and mental health, because there is anecdotal evidence that actually quite a lot of mental health services have been better provided through uh, digital mechanics, such as um, uh, video consultations, uh, than they have been uh, through face-to-face -face, 
and so let, so I don't think we should see this solely as a restraining point. It's also an opportunity point. Thank you. It's really, really good to hear that. So the next question uh, um, for yourself, Le first, Lord Bethel, how do we ensure rapid implementation of uh, innovative digital solutions during COVID continues to benefit patients um, in the next few months and in the future? Well, uh, what, what a great challenge. And, um, you know, uh, I've described how the, how the storm has blown the ship of digital progress across the ocean uh, and, and we've made a lot of progress in some areas incredibly quickly. But I am conscious that the tide is taking us back into port. Um, and so the question quite rightly is how do we somehow fix our sails and, and catch the wind and keep going? I don't have all the answers to that. I mean, people like uh, Matthew will, will understand the subtleties of it. But I think one thing that is really important is that other people in the healthcare system have got to know and believe in the bottom of their boots that they can't achieve their objectives without having a digital resources dimension to their strategy. And if they believe that access to the right data, um, access to the right records, um, being able to reach patients in different ways, um, in, in better ways of doing things that are that are enabled by digital, is, is not only a nice to have, but absolutely essential for their job description, career progression, and, and hitting their targets. That is the way we get ahead. And I think people have seen that uh, during COVID, and that's where we will, that, that is the spirit in which we have to go into this enterprise. Thank you, that's really helpful. Matthew, any further comments on that? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean obviously I, I, I agree with Lord Bethel. If I think, what has happened over the last few months, if we could bottle the key elements of it and build on them, would be absolutely brilliant. So, I mean, one thing is the flow of data, which we've really made progress on. In part, that's been built on emergency regulations, but actually more importantly was the super simple guidance that we put out right at the start and the necessity of sharing data meant we just got on with it and clinicians and people at the front line felt much safer in doing so. Um, I think we need to tech has broken out of its silo for the last few months because we app, everyone knew there was a compelling re set of reasons why we needed to make quick progress in uh, spread of digital technology. We need to keep tech out of its silo. It mustn't go back to being something that's for the techie people to speak to other techie people about. It needs to be, as Lord Bethel says, the business of every frontline leader. They need to know that they're going to be held account on um, how they lead digital transformation in their organisations as much as as much as anything else, which is why again it's important we go back to having clarity around what good looks like. I think that will be one of the essential foundations for making sure that leaders across the NHS and care continue to regard this as important. But actually, the single best thing we could do is capture that spirit of just getting on with it that was born of common purpose and sort of urgent need and making sure that um, if we uh, go into a sort of slightly different world where uh, there isn't quite the same urgent need, that willingness to do things, to get on with it, that sense of common purpose and digital transformation isn't swept away at the same time. Yeah. Thank you, that's that's really helpful. And the next question is, is quite a specific one on digital therapeutics. So I thought I'd just come to Tara to answer that first and then go to Lord Bethel and, and, and Matthew. Um, so uh, the question was, we've heard a lot of talk about remote monitoring, but no mention of digital therapies, uh, which go beyond monitoring and supporting patients and empowering them to self-care. Can you say a little bit more about what NHSX are doing in this area? So if I go to Tara first and, and then Lord Bethel, Bethel and Matthew. Yes, happily. Um, and, and through the regional scale plans, we heard lots of great examples that are doing a huge amount more than just being a monitoring tool, um, but helping people, particularly those living with long term conditions, manage that condition as successfully as possible. And I think we heard about them as well in um, some of the AI awards. Um, for example, the Healthy IO tool that helps 
people um, manage, look at their kidney function when they've got diabetes, which is a really, really important um, aspect of preventing severe kidney disease for them. Um, examples that we've seen uh, include, um, uh, well, the, there's the work that we have done recently that Lord Bethel referenced around looking after people who've been hospitalised with COVID at home. Um, and there they're given uh, an app to record their symptoms daily, a pulse oximeter to look at their oxygen levels. And it's been enormously helpful at enabling people to recover well at home, um, but also give clinicians that real-time data insight that they need. Um, we actually just did a, a, a webinar on this on Tuesday that's been recorded and we will circulate it because there's huge interest in how virtual wards can be used for a range of conditions um, to monitor patients out of hospital when they've got an acute medical condition. Um, and in long term conditions, we're seeing some fantastic examples as well. Um, we talked previously about the, um, the home monitoring of warfarin. Some of the other cases that we've heard on the regional scale plans really do sound quite innovative. So people with who are on very high dose antipsychotics have to have very regular ECGs in hospital, yet we now have technology that can put an ECG, um, it can turn your smartphone essentially into an ECG machine, things like the Alive Core edition. Um, so can we manage these people in a totally different way, which doesn't require them disrupting their lives and having um, diagnostics um, regularly Regularly, but they can actually have that data themselves. And one of the things that's really interesting is that where patients are empowered with that data and take an active role in self-management, their outcomes are much better. In the war, for an example, 70% of people spent at least 20% more time in the therapeutic range than before. Um, so you could kind of argue keeping well away from clinicians can improve your health. Well, it certainly can if that data is shared actively with patients. So they're kind of just to give a bit more flavour of the types of things that we are talking about when we use that term remote monitoring. Thank you, Tom. It's really helpful. Lord Bethel, any comments on that, that specific initiative? No, I just, you put it very well. You put it very well. <laughs> Matthew, any other comments on digital therapies? Yeah, um, and actually, can I apologise for my slightly film noir lighting? It's a strange effect of where I'm sitting. Um, the uh, I mean, uh, Tara's answer is perfect. Uh, the only thing I would add is from my perspective, the question's actually right. We, we sometimes get very focused on the infrastructure, the standards, the underlying bits. But actually, where this really matters is where it hits the patient and where it improves patient care. And for me, the absolutely highest expression of what we're all doing comes in the reimagination of care pathways. And I mean, you, Lisa, together with Tara, with Simon Eccles and others, together with colleagues across NHS England's uh, clinical teams, have been doing some brilliant work on redrawing those care pathways so they can make best use of uh, what technology has to offer to improve outcomes and um, make sure they work best for patients. And it's something I've been talking to uh, Steve Powis about, the National Medical Director, Hugh McCorkey, the National Improvement Director. We have a shared goal of redrawing, reimagining care pathways precisely so that we can actually, this, this isn't tech for its own sake, it is tech so that it helps the patients and improves the care being given to the patient. Yeah, it's really helpful. As far as you are, I said that well, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we've got another question, a really uh, important, interesting question on financial benefits. Of course, this is this is a, a really uh, tricky one, but things that we need to to really evidence and, and get to the bottom of. Um, so the question is on uh, is NHSX doing work on financial benefits of digital innovation? So I'll come to Matthew and Tara. But Lord Bethel, after that, I wondered if you could comment on the really difficult choices of, of balancing investment in finance and across all of your portfolio. How do you do it and, and, uh, and what decisions uh, and process do, do you go through? Whilst you're having a chance to think about that, I'll just go to, to Matthew and Tara. So the the answer is yes, we do. In fact, we're working on this very hard. Um, as, as, as you may know, we are in the throes of the spending review where all of government competes for a very finite pot uh, and tries to explain why the things that it is 
uh, asking for, whether it's a sort of boost in housing or a new road or uh, in our case, investment in uh, digital, uh, digital technology and health and care is uh, an efficient and effective worthwhile use of taxpayer money. And so we are trying very hard to put together the case. And frankly, if anyone on the call has any brilliant evidence, examples or statistics, now is exactly the time to share them with us. Um, because the truth is, um, at the application layer, you can prove very effective uh, results and benefits. If you're looking at a uh, e-triage app or remote monitoring or some of the some of some of the 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 uh, proven productivity enhancing uh, technologies that we're deploying. Where it gets harder is making the case at the more foundational layer. So explaining why investing long term in the digitization and health and care is a really sound investment for the future. Because I think as we all know, the benefits are often quite slow to come and indirect, but huge and very real if we get it right. Wonderful. And, and Lord Bethel, in terms of the portfolio that you have, how, how do you make those decisions and, and, uh, and what are the choices, the difficult choices that um, you, you have to contend with? Yeah, I mean, uh, Matthew put it well, you know, that in healthcare, you, we have people presenting acute and challenging conditions at A&E and in primary care every hour of every day. And we need the best possible outcomes for them. In, so there is a constant and massive uh, demand for resources and it's a you know healthcare is a, a machine that just consumes a huge amount of resources and and therefore everything that's taken away from the front line has to be justified and yet the benefits for, for stuff can be can be quite long term i mean I, I know from other um careers in other industries you know sometimes it can take a decade for, stuff, for an investment today to work its way through and the um, benefits can be seemingly imperceptible but when you get it right, it makes all the difference. So we have to be, we, you know, we have to work hard to justify. The good news, though, is that we have a government that leans heavily into health tech. We have a secretary of state who is passionate, not just about um, technology for technology's sake, but is an evangelist for the long term benefits of, of, a, of the technology and digital agenda. And he knows that from his, his own experiences in government and from his belief in, in where health tech is going. And we have a government that through the last election uh, and through its manifesto commitments um, has committed itself to a huge re um, uh, and revolutionary um, reform agenda on health and that completely buys into the NHS and the modernization of the healthcare uh, proposition. So the political context is really, really strong. Um, and I think we just all have to work very hard on the uh, uh, um, return on investment and the cost benefit analysis to make sure that we've got the, the arguments in place. Thank you. That's really uh, that's really helpful and uh, uh, gains an insight into some of the, the tricky issues that we that you have to deal with um, every day. Um, so the final question now is about NHS staff and how we can support and engage them in the um, the digital revolution. Um, so it's a huge huge question. We need to ins inspire frontline NHS staff, and I'm going to come to Tara first and then to Matthew and Lord Bethel um, leave you with the, the last word if that's okay this, this is our final question. Tara I'll come to you first. Tricky question to end on. Um, I think what, what we have seen through the pandemic is a huge leap in terms of faith of lots of staff across the NHS to embrace new technologies and try them and this is immense valuable um, we need to build on it and support it but we have to be conscious that people have adopted at great pace without the usual support I mean, we did set up a national uh, implementation support team to try and do some hand-holding particularly in primary care um, but people have been have been remarkable haven't they uh, and I think I've seen the possibilities so that does make it much more straightforward um, and I think it's, it's it's also about the leadership of different organizations we had we spent quite a lot of time at our last event getting an update 
update on the digital ready workforce work, which is incredibly important, and their board leadership programme. Um, and in fact, NHSX has invested a bit more this year in digital capability building because we think it's so um, tremendously important. Um, so that's I, I will I will stop there and hand over to the other people to respond to the question. But but it is critically important. And the big message we get. So at the moment we're working on clinical communications tools and there's huge enthusiasm from the system to use that. The clinicians can see that it helps them save time and it's a useful tool designed with a really excellent UI. If you have digital products like that, it's not a difficult sell. It's where people are using systems that are actually adding to their clinical workload that they can be much more resistant and wouldn't you be? Uh, so uh, I think that's absolutely right, Tara. I've come up with a very quick list of six ways. Um, I think we should involve staff. Tech should be done with them rather than to them. Uh, so building tech with uh, the user in mind, shock horror, I think is absolutely key to this. I think we need to give staff the skills and confidence to use technology rather than uh, something that too many of them are, are wary of. Um, so I think that the Digital Ready Workforce Programme, the, the, the serious uplift in spending and investment we're doing on that is key. I think they need to feel well led in technology. So it tech, tech it back to breaking out the silo. They need to see their chief executives and medical directors leading this, not um, the tech people in the basement. We need to give them kit that isn't uh, ancient and doesn't take them half an hour to log on in the morning and crash uh, just when they they finished writing up a report. Um, we need to give them products, as Tara says, that are a joy to use. There's no reason that uh, tech products in uh, health and care shouldn't be as intuitive and simple as uh, the apps that we use in every other aspect of our lives. And we need to create rules that mean they can use technology and use data in ways that don't scare the bejesus out of them because they think they might get in trouble if they did the wrong thing. Uh, so I think it's a, a set of different things. If we can get some of those right, would make a big difference. Well, um, I, Matthew six, um, a list of six is, is an immaculate um, and, and exemplary uh, showcase of considerate management. Um, I will completely endorse what he just said, but put a more radical case. Um, I, you know, I come from. I, I spent my beginning of my career in the music industry, um, where there was a lot of producer interest about the CD. Um, uh, industry and you know frankly a lot of people in record labels and, and artists found the whole thing really convenient and the digital revolution in music has been incredible uh, many many more people are engaged in music they listen to lots more music they listen to a much wider variety of music they pay a lot less for it and they enjoy it a lot more so there has been a complete revolution in the way in which the world consumes music and they basically enjoy it a lot more and get a lot more out of it. That's what I want to see in health. I think there's a huge um, uh, agenda here for rebooting the relationship between uh, patients and their health uh, that, that sees massive, massive upsides, firstly for patients in terms of um, in terms of their outcomes, but also the workforce in terms of the uh, enjoyment and sat satisfaction and, and career path that they've got. And lastly, for the state to be able to afford a, a healthcare uh, system that delivers uh, higher life expectancy and higher quality of life for the people. So I am hugely, hugely and ideologically committed uh, to this agenda. And I am very grateful for all those innovators on this call who are powering the system and making it all happen. Thank you. And on that note, I'm going to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers, Lord Bethel, Matthew Gold, Irene Bolcheski and Tara Donnelly. Um, thank you to all of the innovators who have joined us. I think it was just under 300 uh, innovators um, that uh, spent time on the call uh, today. So 
do uh, keep um, giving us your comments, your feedback. It's really, really important for us. We know um, we're on the journey to, to supporting you and making it easier, but we haven't got there yet and we need to do much more work and we would like you to keep giving your feedback so we can get better at that. And finally, to, I wanted to say thank you to my colleagues at NHSX who've put um, the agenda together and supported with the technology. Um, thank you very much. And uh, we're going to now move into the next section um, which will be the workshops. Um, so colleagues have um, sent the links um, to all um, uh, to all of you, uh, all of the innovators. We posted those three groups um, in the chat. So the procurement group, the maternity and child health group and the tech standards group. Um, and we're going to convene that at 5.30. So if people could go, um, uh, I think you've got two minutes to get a cup of tea or a glass of water and people could go directly into those conversations. Thank you so much um, for contributing um, on the call today.